Valentine's Day is upon us, and that means exactly two things. First, today is the perfect day to talk about some of history's most famous couples. And second, hit the grocery stores tomorrow and all the chocolate on Earth is going to be on sale. Godspeed, friends. All right, let's do some history. First, let's hop all the way back to Homer's Iliad, which sees our hero Achilles reacting extremely poorly to the loss of his one true love. And before you ask, no, I am not talking about his war bride Briseis, I'm talking about his boyfriend Patroclus because of course I am. And their story actually starts a ways before the Trojan War. As a child, Patroclus was banished from his homeland of Locris by committing an oopsie doopsie manslaughter on one of his friends, and sent across the Malian Gulf to Phthia to serve as a squire for the young prince Achilles. According to the poet Hesiod, Achilles and Patroclus grew up together, trains together with the centaur Chiron, and when news of the Trojan War came to town, they both noped right the heck on out of there to the island of Skyros. There, Achilles disguised himself as one of the king's daughters and almost dodged the draft until buzzkill Odysseus came to cash in that pesky little Panhellenic blood oath. And so our story takes us to the beaches of Troy, where it seems like nothing really happens for nine straight years, and then suddenly everything happens all at once. You all know the drill. Achilles gets mad at the most infuriating character in ancient history. He and Patroclus go to Sulk and also bang, maybe. Then Patroclus gets dressed up in Achilles' armor to go fight the Trojans. This works astoundingly well until Apollo nerfs his spatial awareness, and the ensuing hailstorm of javelins does him in shortly after. This, of course, sets the plot into Act 3, where Achilles goes justifiably berserk over the death of his person and murders his way across the Trojan army until he gets murdered back. War, am I right? Per Achilles' own request, his ashes were mixed with Patroclus in the same funerary urn so that they could be with each other for eternity. Now, to anybody with basic reading comprehension, this is an extremely touching story of a lifelong love. A story so central to the plot of the Iliad that the epic literally doesn't make sense if Achilles and Patroclus don't love each other more than life itself. But scholars and historians haven't always seen it that way. Now, I partly wanted to talk Patroclus because it's emblematic of how LGBT history can be ignored and even totally rewritten. Heck. In 2003's Troy, Achilles and Patroclus are recast as cousins, because the only way the filmmakers could justify their all-consuming love in a totally not-gay manner was to make them blood relatives. And this isn't limited to Hollywood, because if a classicist can look you in the eye and tell you that Sappho's poems are just gals being pals, then you know that the open acknowledgement of LGBT history is gonna be a little sparse, even in ancient Greece, the single gayest locale in history. In conclusion, if you want a good dose of the ancient OTP, go read the Song of Achilles. Thank me later. Now let's skip ahead a millennium here to the tale of our favorite disaster couple, Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Born into the disaster dynasty that was the Ptolemaic family, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt had previously been the squeeze of choice for famed womanizer and knife wound aficionado Julius Caesar. But for this story, we're skipping ahead to the part where Caesar's adopted heir, Caesar's favorite general, and some loser third guy divvied up the Roman Republic between them. Octavian took Italy in the west, and Marcus Antonius took Greece in the east. Strategically speaking, Cleopatra needed Rome's support to keep Egypt independent, and Antony needed Egyptian money and manpower to help him fund a campaign against the Parthians. Out of convenience alone, Antony's Eastern Rome and Cleopatra's Egypt were a perfect match, and it just so happened that Antony and Cleopatra got along pretty well too. In the decades since their first meeting, Cleopatra and Antony fell in love, had three children together, and slowly went about consolidating their states into a shiny new Romano-Egyptian empire. They established a formal imperial succession between their children, Antony gave Cleopatra a few Roman provinces, Provinces. Cleopatra gave Antony an army that evaporated on first contact with the Parthians, Antony's political and military power soon became wildly outgunned by Octavian in the West, and this formerly bulletproof alliance was starting to buckle under its own weight. Uh-oh. Undaunted by the impending perils of war with Western Rome, Antony and Cleopatra hosted an elaborate festival where they awarded their children with Roman provinces, Egyptian territories, and entire kingdoms yet unconquered, basically gifting the entire Eastern Mediterranean to one middle schooler and three toddlers. I shudder to imagine what the baby shower's gift registry must have looked like. Ah uh, yes, so I see here that you're interested in buying the island of Cyprus for the royal baby, but unfortunately Senator Lucius has already purchased it. Could I perhaps interest you in a subtler and more intimate gift. Like the Parthenon. <laughs> Okay, things really went south for them at the Battle of Actium against Octavian, where Cleopatra bailed from the fight entirely and Antony followed swiftly after. Now, abandoning your entire navy is a less than optimal battle strategy, so from there it was pretty much game over. Sources from Plutarch to Shakespeare proceed to squeeze every last ounce of drama out of the defeated couple with elaborate suicides and picturesque scenes of dying in each other's arms, but the reality was probably a little less theatrical. Whether you subscribe to the snakebite or not, there's no 
denying that the tale of Antony and Cleopatra just bleeds tragedy. Two monarchs starting on top of the world, only to be crushed by the weight of their own hubris. So for all of their genuine love, they are nonetheless history's prime disaster couple. Hopping forward one metric Roman Empire, we arrive at the Byzantine royals Justinian and Theodora. Ruling together from the 520s to the late 540s, Justinian and Theodora were the definitive imperial power couple of the ancient world, and they oversaw everything from the sweeping reconquest of the Western Mediterranean, comprehensive legal reforms, and an extensive building program. But professional accomplishments aside, it's their private lives that raise the most eyebrows. Justinian's uncle and adoptive father Justin started as a humble farmer before becoming emperor, and Theodora was the daughter of a air trainer in Constantinople's Chariot Stadium. I'll be entirely honest, until right now I didn't know that they had bears involved in the chariot races, but now that my curiosity has been piqued, I am dismayed that I will never see a real-life barriot race. Anyway, early in her career, Theodora was an actress, which Romans actually viewed as demeaning, since actor was a byword for stripper, which was a byword for prostitute. Now, it's worth noting that our best source for this period is one dude named Procopius, who wrote a handful of accounts about Justinian and Theodora. Most of them are fairly straightforward and praiseful, but in the Renaissance we discovered his secret history, which goes out of its way to paint the royal pair as duplicitous, malevolent, and extremely slutty. I'm not going to go into details because I like my monetization, thank you very much, but if you're jonesing for a thrill, go look up Secret History Theodora Geese. Now, all this historical shade-throwing notwithstanding, the relationship between Justinian and Theodora was a somewhat unlikely one. Theodora came from a lower class, and her family wasn't a political asset, and there was even a law in place to stop high-ranking officials from marrying actresses. But as soon as the two met, they fell in love, and then Justinian axed the law about not marrying actresses, and they became an unstoppable team. While Justinian focused on the big-picture imperial business, Theodora managed all of the backdoor diplomacy and stopped court frustrations from slipping into conspiracy territory. Early in their career, when rioting sports fans were several days into their quest to burn Constantinople to the ground and Justinian was making plans to escape, Theodora convinced him to stay and face the crisis. A decade later, Justinian had fallen into a coma and Theodora held the empire together in his absence, dodging what really should have been a civil war. And after Theodora died in 548, Justinian never remarried. And though he kept things moving for the last 17 years of his reign, he was never as sharp as he had been when he had Theodora by his side. Between her and Cleopatra, Patria, powerful women in history often get an unfair shake, either treated as footnotes on their husbands and or accused of your standard issue sexual depravity. But regardless, Justinian and Theodora's mutual love and support make them one of history's finest power couples. And finally, you've heard of marrying for political alliances, but what about marrying your way into a brand new country, and a world-conquering empire at that? Well, that brings us all the way up to the late 1400s, when the kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, and Portugal were wrapping up their 7th century reconquista against the Moors. In 1469, nice, Princess Isabella of Castile had subverted the latest of her brother King Henry's attempts to marry her off to the Prince of Portugal, and instead got herself engaged to her second cousin, <laughs> Prince Ferdinand of Aragon. Now, an interfamilial pairing like this was not only icky, but explicitly illegal, so Ferdinand and Isabella had to get a formal dispensation to marry from the Vatican itself. Luckily, the Pope in question was none other than Rodrigo Daughterbanger Borgia, who never so much as blinked at the implications of incest. So that legal roadblock was cleared with unsettling ease, and the happy prince and princess patiently waited to assume their thrones. After Henry of Castile died in 1474, and John of Aragon died in 1479, Isabella and Ferdinand became the sole rulers of the combined kingdom of Castile and Aragon, which stretched across Iberia and all the way to Sicily. From there, it was go time. Following a slew of over Due reforms to the economy and justice system, Ferdinand and Isabella began a final push into Granada to conquer the last Muslim pocket of Iberia. By 1492, they reconquisted their way to the fortress of Alhambra. To the delight of geometry teachers around the world, they preserved the palace and all of its Islamic artwork, but they were a lot less forgiving on a personal level. Jews and Muslims across Spain were forced to convert or leave, and so the king and queen brought centuries of beautiful religious multiculturalism to a grinding halt. But as you probably know, that is far from from the only thing to have happened in 1492, as the monarchs financed the transatlantic voyage of famed Genoan cheesemaker and part-time murderer Christopher Columbus. His voyages opened up the door to a century of rabid colonization and made Spain fabulously rich. Some economists would argue, too rich. 
Though Isabella died in 1504 and Ferdinand died in 1516, the consequences of their marriage affected literally almost everything. Their daughter Joanna inherited the Spanish throne and proceeded to marry into the soon-to-be notorious Habsburg family, whose subsequent empire is inversely proportional to the size of their gene pool. And that is how one frisky family reunion took Spain from this to this. And though I may be disgusted by the context, I'm also quite impressed because Ferdinand and Isabella are easily one of the most consequential couples in world history. So we've learned a little bit about history, but what can these couples tell us about love? Well, I'd say it's one, given some historians have devoted their entire careers to erasing homosexuality and or slandering every single woman in power, always consider whom you take relationship advice from. And yes, I do see the irony in that statement. Two, Stay grounded in your relationship. A Roman province is no substitute for honest affection. Three, effective communication and teamwork strategies are a crucial stepping stone on your path to both a healthy relationship and imperial glory. And number four, um, oh gosh, look at the time. You know, it goes so fast when you're having fun, but that's all we've got here today. So I'll see you next time, later. Thank you so much for watching. There are obviously many more than just four famous couples in world history, so let me know some of your personal favorites, and that way they might appear in next year's Valentine's Day special. Anyway, enjoy the holiday and go get you some discount chocolate. You deserve it.